the, uh, uh, the point of it all is that when I went into that second business and sold that when I was 43, I was determined not to repeat the mistakes that I had made the first time. I said, I don't want to ever have to go back to work because I was stupid enough to lose right. what I made. How do people who are thinking about preserving wealth go about it? What's the process? And I noticed that there were sort of two very different ways to do it. One, you could try and get advice from people who wanted to sell you that advice, but they always had a, an amazing coincidence between the products they were selling and the advice they were giving. <laughs> And these are people who, <laughs> while they might be legitimate, are literally selling rather than serving. It's very hard to give unbiased advice. You can try, but it's really hard. The minute I'm paying somebody to give me advice, it changes the dynamic. Or you can learn from fellow peers who have no ax to grind, who have no product to sell you, but are there simply to share with you their experience and learn from you your experience. So in order for this process to work, everyone at the table, 12 to 15 members around a table once a month, every month, sometimes 5, 10, 15 years, has to be able to teach and learn. If you don't have something unique that allows you to teach something, I don't want you at my table because I want to learn something from you. And in return, I want to share with you whatever my unique knowledge is. And then I want to make one and one make three, or in this case, 12 make 20 because uh, of 12 different points of view. So the simple insight uh, that Tiger 21 has grown on is that people going through a transition primarily after having a significant, very significant liquidity event can best learn the process of preserving wealth from peers in a totally confidential setting. But uh, I didn't create what I'm about to say, but it's a totally applicable. Investors sign up, but people show up. Mm -hmm. What that means is that what we found as we evolved was that the primary challenge for our members, while they were wealth preservers for the first time, having created great wealth to begin with, there are a number of issues that when you're quite wealthy, allow you or force you to work through a different crucible. Um, issues of children, legacy, philanthropy, all of these things take on a very different uh, tone uh, when you're in the press or your kids yeah. know how much you're worth or they realize that they're worth or will be worth a lot more than their friends and knowing how to deal with it. Really the number one issue in Tiger 21 is uh, members' concerns about not screwing up their kids. How do they, how do they give them as many benefits as every parent would like to give their children without giving them too much that it totally screws the kids up. That's an almost impossible balance to find. How do you go about starting an organization like that? Because to your point exactly, when, when you've had a liquidity event like that, the sharks are circling immediately and people know and they, they, they try and glom on and find a way to get in there. Right. How do you go about approaching people and saying that this is different, this is what I'm trying to do because you have to build it up. You're starting with one guy, right? You've got to find one, mother, one more guy to sit at your table. Okay, so it, there's sort of two answers. One answer is I had been a member of another peer-to-peer -peer learning organization. There are two great organizations for CEOs. One is YPO, Young Presidents Organization, and the other is today called Vistage. Then it was called uh, Tech, the Executive Committee, but Tech, morphed into Vistage about 10 or 15 years ago. And both of those organizations have CEOs come together in small groups and in large conferences. They each have around 24, 25,000 members. So you have a pool of about 50,000 CEOs around the globe. And the very small number of them who achieve the greatest level of success financially and who graduate from being CEOs is the candidate pool for our 700 members in Tiger. It's like, it's like if you were in England, you would say that they're Cambridge and Oxford and we're the great graduate school or MIT and Harvard and we're the great graduate school. Uh, that's the place where the largest number of our members come from because if they like the peer-to-peer -peer learning process that both of those organizations own, they'll be comfortable shifting gears into a much more confidential, 
much more exclusive uh, organization. And I only use exclusive because our focus is on uh, people who have created wealth between 10 million and a billion dollars. Our average net worth is about a hundred million dollars. And that obviously speaks to people who've created businesses that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. And then they've sold those businesses and what they're left with is the proceeds that qualify them uh, to be a Tiger 21 member. So you, you talk there about um, how you protect your kids, which is, which is something I've thought about a lot and spoken to various people about a lot. And it is a huge challenge. How have the Tiger 21 members gone about doing that? I mean, I, I know that you include the next generation at the conference, which is a great yes. chance for them to see. What, what initiatives have you put in place to help them do that? I'd say there's sort of two camps and uh, each family has to decide what's best for them. Clearly, there's one camp where parents say, I'm a first-generation wealth creator. Most, almost all Tiger members are first-generation, very different than multi-generation. Yeah. First-generation wealth creators believe that the key to their success was the very humble beginnings that they had that sharpened them up and toughened them up that allowed them to be successful. It turns out that isn't the only way to be successful, but many first generation wealth creators believe it was their humble beginnings, their, their, uh, uh, the poverty or the drug addiction or the disease, whatever happened in their childhood, alcoholic parents, uh, single children. There's endless stories within Tiger 21 about what hardened somebody, steeled them up to prove to the world they could be successful. And for those people, they're trying to recreate some of that um, challenge for their children. And very often they fall into a trap because they forget that they brought their children up not in the same environment that they grew up in. They brought their children up in an amazing environment. And so it has the emotional impact of you get to graduate college and then the parent pulls the rug out from underneath the kid and say, I'm making it tough for you, it's tough love. I don't think that really works. I think people who are now dealing with second and third generation can uh, think about uh, how do you teach your children to be responsible stewards of the wealth that they're gonna inherit. Mm -hmm. But very often, you know, if you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s and your kids are reaching their 20, you're still young enough that you haven't really thought about this issue of wealth transfer. Today, we're witnessing the largest amount of wealth transfer in human history. Over the next generation, the scale of wealth that will be transferred is in the trillions of dollars. So this issue, now there's some techniques. I can share some of the, the uh, techniques. The first is that there's a simple rule. Parents are always wondering, what happens if they treat their kids equally versus disequally? And it's pretty clear to me that it's to each according to their own needs while the parents are alive. But any parent who doesn't leave equally their assets to their children will create potentially very deep emotional scars. There's a few ways to get around it. The one most important is if you're not gonna leave money equally to your kids or not leave them at all, it better be consistent with a family value that is expressed over and over and over again. So as an example, some families believe in public service. So they'll leave a trust to support any child or grandchild that goes into public service. Well, if you go into banking, you're not gonna be part of that, but you understand that the public service trust that your sister or brother is getting reflects deeply held family values. Similarly for the clergy, family farms. Some families believe in preserving family farms. But in each of these cases, while you're treating the children unequally, you're doing it in a way that's consistent with a family value. So this issue of what's equitable and what's equal is at the, at the heart of how uh, parents have uh, done it. And the, the findings from the research I did on the book is the only way you can escape deep emotional scars in your children if you don't treat them equally is to have something like a family meeting or a way to express values that children are steeped in uh, before you're gone. But while you're here, it's each according to their needs. If Sally is buying a house and Johnny is starting a company and uh, Mary has a kid with special needs, you have to deal with each one according to their needs.